What it's up, gang? Welcome to another episode of Hustle Talk. I'm your host, Anson Wu. This is a very special episode because in this episode, I sat down with active angel investor Christopher Deutsch. Together, we talked about what makes a founder great, how angel investors evaluate startup ideas and founder team, and how founders can get funded from angel investors. Chris has over 20 years experience in starting up, investing in, and advising early stage venture backed startups. Chris is also the founder and managing director of Lofty Venture. His investment ranged from five to six figures to early stage, pre seed, or C stage startups. With an awesome bio like this one, the first question, of course, I will ask is, Chris, what else did we miss in your bio? Please tell us more. Here's the interview. Let's take a look. Uh, I'm very focused on Chicago. I do almost exclusively Chicago investments. And the way that I look at investing is actually investing in the founders. The company that they're building at the moment is really just what they happen to be working on. But when I find a good founder, I'm trying to make a multi-decade investment in that founder. And whether it's this company that succeeds and or the next one and the one after that, I really look at building a family here in Chicago. And that family is growing rapidly, especially now through COVID. We've got over 40 companies and over 70 founders in, in the portfolio with also a high focus on diversity. And there's a very good business case for diversity, but over two thirds of our founders, over 68% of our founders have or companies, excuse me, have at least one female and or underrepresented group as a founder or co-founder. Wow, that's great. Um, talk about more, like why, when you look at Chicago comparing to um, West Coast, or East Coast, like how do you see it differently? And, and maybe educate us a little bit about that too. Yeah, so, um, well, Early in my career, we started uh, one of the first e-commerce platforms back in 98 uh, through 2008. We powered Target.com, Overstock, BJ's Wholesale, MTV, very large online retailers. And we had all the big VCs. Um, Benchmark led our first round. Bill Gurley joined our board. Ironically, we actually didn't want Bill to join our board. Nobody knew who he was in 99. Uh, it's a funny story about that I'll, I can share on another webinar. but. I have exposure from coastal investments and more of the kind of high flying valley style kind of companies. And there, there are definitely some, some major differences. And when I moved back to Chicago in 2013, I recognized a couple of those. The, the first real standout difference is these are real businesses in Chicago with, that have real customers with real revenue and real traction really before they raise any kind of money. They have to, it's sort of uh, Darwinian here. It's you, mm, you either get right. customers and revenue uh, and right. you survive right. and thrive or you don't. And it's, you know, that's just sort of it. Uh, so that was a very early sort of realization of the differences. Another one that, I, I mean, I don't wanna, I don't wanna make sweeping generalizations, but the people in Chicago are just different. I don't know if it's the water or what it is, but uh, I, I grew up here. You know, I, I grew up in Old Town uh, down uh, in the city, but I'm originally from Chicago. I spent 15 years out west and then I came back in 2013. Um, and there's a crazy story around that, like sort of came back to work in a real estate business or family real estate business. And that sort of led into angel investing in Chicago. Um, and what I really love about Chicago founders they're just really sincere, genuine people, right? They're they're doing things because they have a, they felt the pain themselves. They're not going online and like googling like what are problems or, you know, yeah. uh, seeing what the big hot companies were in the in the last YC batch yeah. and trying to match them. They're operators that have had a problem or something that bothers them in their life, and mm -hmm. they decide I can't deal with this. The world sucks with this problem. It is my job to to solve that problem. And they figure out how to turn that into a good business. And when you invest in a founder that feels the pain and is so deeply in love with 
the problem and the solution to that problem that they can't sleep, that's when you know that they're going to figure out how to solve that or they're going to keep hitting their head against the brick wall <laughs> until something breaks. And I, I try, I also try to help sometimes with that. I, I, I've definitely fallen in that trap myself, but, um, but ultimately the founders are just a different, a different animal in, in Chicago. And I, I love them. Uh, I do everything I can to support founders in Chicago uh, by investing, mentoring, advising, joining as a board member, you know, like whatever I can do, um, I try uh, with limited bandwidth. Uh, Lofty Ventures is my uh, angel investing platform, but today it's just me and I'm just using my own money. So with limited resources and time and money, I had to pick a focus and sort of luckily, my focus was Chicago because, as I said, we started doing or I came back to Chicago to work in our family commercial real estate business. And I realized any of the companies that I invest in that are Chicago based potentially could be tenants in our buildings. So I said, oh, great. I'll just invest in Chicago based companies because either those founders could be in our buildings or their friends. And then after we sold our real estate portfolio about four years ago, I said, well, why would I invest outside of Chicago? I, I have a, a great community here that I keep growing. When they're local, I can be really hands-on. I can get involved and get in the weeds. I can bring them together to do more activities with each other and learn from other people in the community that I bring together. So I'll physically bring the founders to my home with other people in the, uh, in the community that I'm friends with and help them build real relationships, real community. That's a huge part of it for me is helping these founders connect with their peers, with their uh, potential mentors, advisors, board directors. Um, it, you know, for an example, my first Chicago investment, I, I made my first angel investment in, in 1998. And I only did about a half dozen between 98 and 2013. But then I did my first Chicago investment in a company called Popular Pays, which is now they went through YC many years ago, five years ago, and they, they completed their B round a year or two ago. They're doing very well. Um, and I was sitting down with the founder, uh, Corbett Drummy, a year ago, and he was telling me about his ideal board, outside uh, board director that he'd love to recruit. And he basically described a very good friend of mine, Amanda Lannert, without saying her, her name. And I said, have you ever heard of Amanda Lannert from Jelly Vision? He said, oh my God, you know, she'd be my first choice. I, I hope I'm not violating any trust if those guys are watching. Uh, and I said, well, why don't I make an introduction? I like both both you guys. I think maybe there could be a fit there. And about six months later, she joined the board. So, you know, that's that's hopefully what we're able to do here in Chicago is really help make the right connections. And I don't mean connections in a transactional way, but connections in terms of like that turn into relationships that become the roots of a really strong community. And I look at Lofty Ventures, our founders, as a small community inside of the broader Chicago community. And I think we can all together really help all boats rise. Yeah. And, and I think you hit a good point where you feel like Chicago founders are a problem solver, right? Like, like we're very personal when it comes to the startup too. Not to say others are not. I do sense the same feeling too working in Chicago. I think I think that kind of resonates. And kind of going going along the same same route. Um, when did you start feeling entrepreneurial? Like you went to high school, you went to school in Evanston, right? Like, like how, what's it like I hanging out with you back, back in high school? Like, were you like tinkering stuff? Were you like have a side hustle then? Like, so, um, so I, I do have a story. Actually, I can give you two quick stories. I'll try to make them as quick as I can. But first I, I do want to uh, give a shout out to Amanda. I saw it uh, out of the corner of my eye. She, she did text something. Um, and uh, I usually am watching, I was watching her earlier today. I never miss and this, for anybody that's on right now, if you ever see an opportunity to watch Amanda Lannert speak, take it, always. I, we're, I would consider her one of my closer friends, but I will be any, in any room on any virtual event I can to listen to her because she is the most brilliant and the best CEO I've ever met. So a uh, little, little plug, shout out to Amanda. Um, okay, so my first entrepreneurial experience uh, is actually, really, really important fundamentally for me. My, my dad sat me down. So we live in Old Town. So anybody that like knows Chicago, like real OG Chicago people will know this thing called the Old Town Art Fair. So uh, we grew up in, in Old Town. My dad came to me when I was nine years old and said, Chris, 
you're going to do a lemonade stand this year. And I had done lemonade stands before. And I said, okay. And he said, no, you're going to do it in front of the house during the Old Town Art, art Fair. And just for reference for people that don't know, the Old Town Art Fair is the, is the oldest juried art fair in the country. And it basically started, um, like the entrance to it is basically out right in front of our home that I grew up in front of. And so uh, my, my dad sort of like wanted to make this a real thing. I forgot like where I sort of started like brainstorming and where, like where he stopped and I started kind of thing. But the first year we did it and I did it for four years. So from nine to like 12 years old, I think it was. Um, it was my first real entrepreneurial experience. I literally, I, I got a partner. He, he was my babysitter, right? He was like three or four years older than me. He lived down the street. He was my partner. We, we went through product development. We created our own kind of lemonade. Uh, it was a hybrid of fresh squeezed with uh, frozen concentrate. Um, All right. We actually had, uh, uh, in part of the product development, we had 16 ounce cups. We put a slice of lemon on the side because we knew that would be a nice garnish. But we put nine ounces of ice in a 16 ounce cup, which meant we have seven ounces of, of our higher cost inventory that we had to, so it actually saved our costs. Um, we did all these amazing things and each year it got more and more complex and because we were so excited about it. Like every year, Zan, who is my, uh, my, uh, my babysitter, uh, that was my partner, we came up with these amazing ideas. Like in the second year, we actually, my dad introduced me to, he was the owner of, my dad was in real estate. So we had amazing access for these things. And I'm very fortunate and, and, and lucky to have this, but he knew the, the person that owned again, Chicagoans that'll remember the rock and roll McDonald's. So he knew the guy that owned that mm -hmm. and he introduced me and I'm this little 10 year old entrepreneur. Right. And, and Len, uh, I think is Al Lencioni, I think was his name. If I'm remembering correctly, this is 35 years ago. Uh, he was so impressed that he said, we'd love to sponsor you. So he gave us straws, McDonald's straws, napkins, bags of ice. And he had the Ronald McDonald, like, you know, the guy, right? Drive yeah, up yeah. to our house in the Corvette that they had and deliver all this stuff. So it was like a marketing stunt slash part. Anyway, like all this stuff, these four years were so f formative and fundamental for me. I remember every year, two weeks before the Old Town Art Fair would kick off, I'm brainstorming and I'm making signs and like all this stuff. It was like, I really got the bug, like really, really got the bug. So that was really important to me. Fast forward 25 years, so 10 years ago, a friend of mine, actually a partner of mine is leaving my house in Arizona. This is where I was for 15 years. And he was a professor at, um, at uh, Thunderbird University, which is like the number one international business school in the world. And he said, uh, as he was leaving, we we're making small talk. Uh, and I said, um, so what are you teaching tomorrow in your class? He said, oh, I've got to give this lecture on uh, putting yourself in the, in the shoes of a 10 year old kid that's creating a lemonade stand. How would you think about it? I said, oh, I can teach that class. And he goes, well, why don't you come over and do it? He dared me. And I said, okay, I will. And I put together a PowerPoint that night. And it was amazing because it made me reflect on all the things that I learned, product development, accounting, uh, business development, um, finance. Uh, like when we would sell our, our inventory, uh, we actually borrowed money from my parents, which we had to pay back later. Thankfully, they didn't charge us interest over that, you know, weekend or week or whatever. But first um, investor, yeah. yeah, right. And I mean, not a very good one because they didn't right. really get any return on it. But it was it was an incredible experience for us. Like I remember in our first year, we sold three hundred dollars worth. We had one hundred dollars in costs and we split the remaining. It was actually ninety nine fifty. I, I had ninety nine dollars and fifty cents. And so did Zan. I remember. I mean, like, that's your first like real. That wasn't like, oh, I had a lemonade stand. My parents like I made ninety nine dollars and fifty cents out of like thin air. And it blew my mind. So anyway, when I gave this uh, present, the last part of this this question, it's a really good one, by the way, Anson. Uh, I'm giving this presentation and I put in all sorts of really, really like ridiculous photos of me from 1984, right? With like, I was a break dancer. So I did these like funky hats and stuff. And so Zan and I, there were pictures of us from like break dancing right around then. And I put those into the presentation to be kind of fun and, you know, self-deprecating. But what I didn't realize was the class was full of international students from Japan and Germany. 
and they don't understand self-deprecating humor. <laughs> so <laughs> so we, I made an absolute fool of myself. And we were streaming it. So the people that were watching it online were dying laughing. Uh, but yeah, the people in the class were, they, I think they thought we were idiots. But the, the point being, you really can l learn a lot if you take entrepreneurship, uh, even at a very young age, like very seriously. And, and actually, that is a, a short bridge. I'm going to give a plug. Uh, there's a nonprofit that Lofty Ventures is working with this year called Future Founders. And if you're not aware of Future Founders, if, if are you aware of them, Anson? I am, but let's tell the audience what that is. Okay, so just very quick. So uh, one of my absolute favorite nonprofits. Um, we picked them this year uh, as, as the organization that we want to sponsor this year for uh, this program we're putting together called Invest It Forward, which is basically where our founders get to pick a nonprofit each year and Lofty Ventures gives a $10,000 grant uh, to the nonprofit. So the founders in our portfolio don't have to write checks or know anything about nonprofits. They're just part of a selection committee and we collectively decide on the nonprofit we want to support. And then over that calendar year, our founders get involved. Corbett, you know, and, and Raymond from uh, T-Bot. And I mean, we've already had a dozen or two dozen founders that have gotten involved with them. So anyway, uh, amazing organization. They use this thing that we love, entrepreneurship and starting businesses, lean methodology, all that, to help young under-resourced kids in Chicago. And I can't think of a better vehicle to help kids get to the next level than thinking about and learning about entrepreneurship and, and gaining a passion for it, just like I did, just the story that I gave. So um, anyway, uh, huge, huge fan of, uh, of, of Future Founders. And if any, anybody from Future Founders is on, um, we have much love for you guys. What are some common mistakes that people make when they try to reach out to an angel investor like yourself or talking to one at the early stage? Is there such thing as too early? Like when should they start contacting an angel investors? So I've, I've got a great story with this. Um, literally, uh, not last night, three nights ago, I committed to being the first investor. So also like very quick background. I look for first check to seed investments in Chicago. Really, there's like one exception uh, that I'm, I'm closing a deal on right now, but they're very, very few and far between where they're not Chicago based or have a very strong Chicago tie. That's like my first filter. And one of the big reasons for that too is, again, I have limited resources in time and money and Chicago needs tons of help. I'm sure everybody right now is seeing like the war with Trump and, and with uh, Mayor Lightfoot and around violence. What's underlying the problems in our city is not because people are in, in inherently awful. It's because they don't have opportunity. And so the way that we solve that is creating more opportunity. And I'm trying to invest in our nonprofits through like Future Founders and uh, Embark, OWLs, all these great organizations we have in Chicago. But that's not going to be enough to create economic uh, opportunity. And so we're investing in young entrepreneurs. And that's where I can help the most. I'm not good at the later stages. I'm not good at growth or any of that. There are lots of amazing founders in Chicago that are. That's not where I'm good. I'm good when your hair is on fire, when you don't know what's going on. You need help. You need to get connected to money. You need, need to get connected to other amazing um, mentors and advisors and board members. Uh, so so that's, that's why I focus in Chicago. That's one of the big reasons I focus in Chicago. So uh, my first check to seed, um, I look for founders as early as possible because I am investing in people holistically. I'm trying to take the best people I can find and help them be the best founders and best people they can find or they can be. An example of that, three nights ago, I committed to being the first check to a 19 year old student at Loyola. And Ian, I don't know if you're on, um, I think you might, might have been able to catch part of this. Uh, Ian Delick, uh, very, very smart young man. Um, he's building a, a product called uh, Eschaton, which is a uh, hardware software. And I'm not sure how much is, I assume this is relatively public. I think it's on the website. He's building a hardware software uh, technology that goes into cars to enable cars to speak to each other to make driving safer. It's a very lofty pursuit. Uh, it's a very... Um, complicated and challenging technology and business to build. 
And I'm not necessarily the best person to give advice to him on the technology or the um, go to market strategy, but I know lots of people that can help him. The product is really complicated here and I can't do everything that uh, that is needed to support the founder, but I can bring in all the resources and connections that are needed. And so um, that's why I committed. I decided I wanted to be uh, the person that Ian could start to build off of for his career, not just as an entrepreneur, but really his career as his life, right? You know, if I can, if I can be there to help him uh, and the other entrepreneurs that I work with in a very holistic way, uh, that's my goal. And that's really all I care about. I'm building multi-decade relationships. Tell us, how did you meet this founder? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah tell, so, I was gonna ask you. Yeah, so uh, it's a really interesting story. Um, I went to Vassar College uh, 25 years. I graduated in 97, so I don't even know how long ago that was now. Uh, I'm getting really old. I turned 45 next week, so I'm like, <laughs> just I'm kind of a dinosaur. Just getting started. This young man's kid. <laughs> so, uh, so I went to Vassar a long time ago, and one of the other um, students that was there when I was there, who's two years older than me, is this guy, Hunter Walk. And uh, he's now a VC. He runs Homebrew in San Francisco. Um, he was one of the early guys at YouTube. He was like the product manager at YouTube early um, before they got acquired by Google and joined Google and uh, did very well there and decided he wanted to go off on his own and do angel investing. So I follow Hunter um, and I happened to be on about a week or two ago on Twitter and I saw Hunter do CC uh, Logan LaHive uh, to a text or excuse me, a tweet that Ian sent out saying, hey, I'm a young student at Loyola, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm looking for other people I can connect with in Chicago. And that's, and I wasn't following him, I was funding, uh, following Hunter. And because of that, like 10 characters or 15 characters that Hunter sent out, it got my attention. I looked in this, the thread, I sent a message out to Ian. We talked within 24 hours, actually I think it was like the next morning I fell in love. I said, this guy is exactly the kind of founder that I'm looking for. And within a couple, within a week, I'd had him speak with three of our founders and that are far more intelligent and technical than I am, uh, just to vet and see, is this, you know, is this something that, that seems feasible? What do you think of Ian? He sounds great to me. Uh, and I got really positive feedback from all of the founders. And that's when I said, Ian, you are exactly the kind of uh, founder that I'm looking for, and I'd love to be your first investor if you'll have me. And so we sort of worked through that, but it literally all came out of uh, a tweet that Hunter sent out in response to Ian's tweet being in Chicago saying, I'm looking to meet people. So it's, it is kind of an amazing thing. And if you go on Twitter today, about two hours ago, maybe not even, Ian actually tweeted out how incredibly, uh, I, I don't want to speak for Ian, you can read the tweets, but he's basically reflecting on how cool it is to be 19 and get your first check from an investor. And it's, you know, it's a pretty cool. It's amazing. I, I, I'm vicariously living for him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, this is fantastic. And diving a little bit deeper into that too, when you are connecting with founders and entrepreneurs, um, we talk about passion, we talk about, you know, reaching them early. Um, you know, is the presentation Woody that important to you? The pitch, you know, what if a founder is really bad at pitching, but good at business, for example? Like, like what do you yeah. look for in that? Yeah. So some of the people that have been texting me um, know this about me, I think, at this point. Uh, if I was an X-Men, my superpower would be relationship, like creating relationship and community. And so a big core of what that is, is I have a pretty good read of people. Now, there are some exceptions. Uh, my wife would certainly bring these up, but um, I've gotten better at weeding out some of the charlatans. And by, and by the way, uh, this is a plug for Adam Grant, who I, I don't know. I've met you know once or twice in passing, uh, but he is an incredible professor at, uh, at um, Wharton uh, in industrial psychology. And he wrote a book called Give and Take. If you have not read Give and Take, you have to read it. I don't care if you're a founder, if you're an investor, if you work in the food service industry, it doesn't matter. This is basically helping you understand the three types of people on the planet, givers, takers, and matchers. And everybody falls into one of those or somewhere on the spectrum. So you, the, the basic premise is you want to avoid takers at all costs, Trump, 
<laughs> not to make this political, but I mean, I don't know who would disagree with that. Uh, you want to maximize givers. So people like the founders that I bring into the portfolio. And you have to navigate the rest, which are basically matchers, people that are sort of thinking transactionally. Mm -hmm. And and so my first filter, after you get past the like, you know, do we match in 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 business type and are you in Chicago and all that? Yeah. My first filter is, is this person a giver? Are they a good person? And what motivates them? Are they able to articulate? You don't have to be a good presenter. There's a big difference between being a good speaker, a good presenter, and being able to effectively communicate the problem that you're trying to solve. Because that's, that's kind of a different thing, right? Like being a good presenter is being able to go through slides. I think I suck at presentations. I'm not very good at it. If you want to ask me questions that I know the answers to, I'm pretty good at that, right? And I think that's true of a lot of founders. So I'm probably more of a founder in that way than a really polished executive or operator that I have incredible respect for <laughs> and need desperately. Um, and, and every good sort of like, you know, crazy harebrained founder, um, similar to me needs. Uh, but it's not about having a slick presentation. In fact, if it's too slick, it, it worries me, right? Like, are they a salesman? You know, like, what am I missing? I, I want to see the mistakes. I want to see the cracks in the veneer. I want to, I want to know like who they are as real people. So my diligence, when I'm looking at a deal is 90% the founder. I will spend as much time as I can with the founder. I'll give you another example. I just uh, committed to investing in a Chicago, actually I'm in two Techstars companies from this cohort in Chicago. And one of them is Todooly. And um, shout out to those guys if, if they're on right now. But uh, Sergio is an incredible founder. I like the absolute prototyp prototypical of what I look for. He's, he's an immigrant from, uh, from Chile. He is brilliant beyond brilliant. And our first interaction, uh, I, I will take any introduction from any of my friends uh, that are investors or founders or whatever. If they say, Chris, you should talk to this guy. I'm like, I'm really busy right now. Just trust me, you should take it. Absolutely, I'll, I'll, I'll find time. And I was earmarking 30 minutes for this Zoom. 30 minutes turned into three hours. And I was blown away. And I said, oh, God, Sergio, I gotta tell you, I, I really like what you're doing here. I was very concerned about the market and stuff, but the way you're approaching it is really novel. You've thought through this incredibly well, but unfortunately you're in Detroit, you know? And I, I know like you guys were coming in from Detroit for Techstars and he goes, no, 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 Chris, I'm moving to Chicago in two weeks. And I said, oh no, <laughs> I guess I gotta add these guys now to my list. So I've got like a crazy list now. It's like 15 or 20 companies I've done since COVID started, it's crazy. And so I added them to the list and he said, why don't we take a next step when I get to Chicago in two weeks after I move, let's meet in person, you know, physically distance for COVID and we can get to know each other a little bit. And we spent four hours in person. Uh, he came over to my, my, my neighborhood and we sat, you know, there was nobody else around, so it was COVID safe. But I learned not just about him and his story, the story started with his grandmother and how his grandmother influenced his parents and how they influenced him, how he got to the US and how all of that has influenced where he is today and why he cares about building the product that he's building because mm. he felt the pain himself in a very similar way to my lemonade stand story. And I was absolutely in love. I mean, like I looked, if not all investors are the same and there's a huge difference between angels and, and uh, VCs. Angels are investing their own money. VCs are investing other people's money. Right. I can fall in love with a founder and I can make investments that VCs would think are crazy, even if I know that they're brilliant, right? I'm, I don't want to say like the investment is brilliant, but the founder is brilliant. And I actually don't care if this is the business that Sergio builds that turns into the hundred million or billion dollar exit. It's in him, right? It's either this one or the one after or, or both or the one after that. And I want to be the first person he talks to when he's looking to build his next company. I don't know if that answered the question. I, I rambled yeah, a little. Yeah. So it's not just the presentation. I think a lot of us, especially like first time founder, they focus so much on the presentation, the pitch, but they're kind of forgetting the actual, the person, the story behind it. I think that's what you're saying. That's what you care about rather than a sleek, you know, PowerPoint presentation, right? 
So it, when, when you're talking about investing, especially like first check, right? Like kind of area, but first check to seed, 90% of what you're investing in is the founder, whether the investor realizes that or not, everything is gonna change. The name, the market, market conditions, revenue sources. I mean, look at COVID, right? Like everything right. has changed He's in good ways and bad, right? Sure. So what you're investing in is not the business. It's not the product. That's all going to change. If it's a super mature company, like, you know, I'll pick on Amanda again, like Jelly Vision, they'll change and evolve, but not nearly as much as Ian's mm -hmm. going to, right? Like everything is going to change except for Ian. So you want to pick the best skipper you can for that ship. Right. And this is just the ship that he's steering right now. I might invest in the next ship or maybe this ship pivots and it turns into another ship. I don't really care. I'm just there to help Ian be the best he can in business and just personally. And again, like I, I keep saying this, but holistically, if we take care of our founders as investors, holistically, making sure that they're happy and well balanced and fed and they sleep. <laughs> I'm sure there's, I'm sure I have founders that, right now that laugh. They're laughing, but I have literally asked many of my founders, are you sleeping? Are you spending time with your fiance? If Raymond's watching, he's laughing. Uh, are, are you getting enough exercise? These are important things. If you burn out selfishly as an investor, you're no good to me, right? Like if, if it's just to be selfish, but obviously it's a lot more than that, right? Like I could be doing a lot of things. I do this because I love it. And I can't do the things that these founders can do, but I can help them do what they want to do and maybe a little bit better. So that's why I do it. It does seem like you're building a very nice ecosystem here in Chicago where you can really give a lot of resource to the founder. Um, do you have a preference or does it matter for founder, solo founder versus co-founder in your evaluation? What do you, you have some company that with multiple founders, right? Some with solo founders. Like, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so Chicago is a unique place. Again, I'll give another example. Um, another tech stars company I just invested in. Uh, there was a solo founder in this company. It's called Havoc Shield. And they create um, they create uh, security, like kind of going to be, I think, amazing in work from home world. Uh, they create security for small businesses, individuals, et cetera. And it was a solo founder going through tech stars. His name's Brian. Um, the thing that was really interesting about this solo founder is that is a solo tech founder. Chicago is very rarely seeing solo tech founders. You see this a lot more in the coasts, right? Because there just happen to be more technical people there. Chicago is blessed with a couple really good schools. You've got Northwestern, we've got um, University of Chicago, got Loyola, we got DePaul. There's a lot more. But when you think about Chicago founders, you usually think about business founders. You don't go like that solo founder is the best technologist I've, I've ever met, right? That's very rare. Brian was one of those cases. It, Ian, one of those cases. It is much harder for us to find a business co-founder to add on to a Brian or an Ian than it is to find a Brian or an Ian in Chicago. That's just the reality of it. The good news too is with COVID, we're actually disintermediating geography. So you could technically have a co-founder in Chicago and a co-founder in New York. I have a company I invested in that did that. It's called Paladin. They're from uh, 17 or 18 Chicago tech stars. In fact, I invested in them uh, specifically because one of the co-founders is in Chicago, Kristen. So, um, so that's actually, a, a positive for us in Chicago, having such a wealth of business talent here. But it's it was it's so rare when you have one of these solo tech founders in Chicago that that's a good bet to make. Again, as long as they check all the boxes, they're super smart, passionate, have so much hate or love, depending on how you're thinking about it, for the problem they're trying to solve. The passion, right? yeah. It, and that, I'm going to go on a tangent here because this is really important. Everybody goes passion, passion, bad. There's a reason that we talk about passion and, and this is it. So as an early stage founder, everything looks rosy. Everything's doing this, right? But it's not. You're going to go through ebbs and flows while you're building your business. 
and everything's awesome when you're on the uptake. But when you're going down and you've just lost all of your clients because of COVID and you don't know what's happening, what, like we have to lay off the three employees we have, how do we get back up here? This trough is where passion carries you through. And not only is it just like an important thing to have in your life, but as an investor, if I don't see passion, not just passion in the founder, but passion for the problem they're trying to solve, and it's personal, right? Like it hurts them. Yeah. Then what's going to get them through that that downturn? So that's going to happen a lot. And so that passion is really important. I'm sorry, that's such an important tangent. I lost the. Tra- I'm ADHD. Excuse me. Uh, what, what was what was the, the the question I was trying to answer you, that I do had you a tangent? prefer solo founder versus oh yes founders or it doesn't matter to you? Yeah. So I always think like my preference would always be like have a co-founder, right? Like it's always good to have a partner in crime, right? Like you need somebody who understands your pain as intimately as a sibling would when, you know, when you're growing up together and how, you know, how crazy your parents are only your brother or sister. Really, and I was a solo child, so I'm an only child, which probably explains a lot, but, um, but you, I think it's really helpful to have that, that sort of, you know, early partner. And there, we, I mean, we could talk for two hours just about the importance and the nuance. And what if I bring on a founder later, do they get equal equity and like all that? There's a lot of philosophy and a lot of discussion around all that. But I think as soon as you can, you really want to have a co-founder. That's my own take. And, and Brian brought in an incredible co-founder who's known for years. Uh, Phil is absolutely a rock star. The two of them t- together, I just literally today, I think I wired more money to that. Uh, and just signed docs right before this uh, to increase my position. But I was his first investor. I was Havoc Shield's first investor after they went through Techstars. Um, I am very bullish on uh, the two of those guys. So yeah, I guess the long answer to the question, but it's a very good and important question is, I would recommend all founders have a co-founder. A partner, co-founder. What kind of expectation you think the founder should have after you invested? Like how... You know, do they give you reporting? Do you expect them to like do a status call every week, every month? Um, for people that haven't dealt with investor before, what can they expect when they got the first check? What does it mean afterward? Uh, it's a big one. You asked a lot of like, like there's a ton there. I'm gonna try to pick some parts uh, yeah, apart it. from that. So, so, so first, uh, there's a really good book, I think, for both investors especially angel investors and founders to read. It's called, I think it's just Angel by Jason Calcanis. And if you don't know who Jason is, it's he's just at Jason on Twitter. I believe he was the first investor in Uber, uh, like and super early in all these others, Thumbtack, Calm, I don't know, like, like six or seven different like Decacorn and Unicorns. He's like mega deal. Uh, this book is really, really good. There's one thing, almost all of it listening to it was very affirmational. Uh, It really helped me realize the things that I've sort of been doing on my own and learning while doing are actually the right things to do. And given my superpower is this like building relationships and building community, that's probably the most valuable thing that you can have as an angel investor, probably just investor in general, definitely as an angel. So I I should say as an active angel, and I do this full time, there are definitely lots of angels that, you know, they write checks on the side, but they're really full time CEO or something, which is great. Like we want those. There's nothing, nothing wrong with that at all. I, I'm, I'm actually more of a rarity. Um, usually if you're doing this full time, you're doing this as an investor where you can get like, you know, carry and, and, and fees and stuff. I just honestly don't want to wager other people's money. It like terrifies me, um, especially since I make some, some like really crazy bets. But um, I think those are the, the most fun and the most interesting. So, um, so in his book, uh, he talks about, there's a very specific part he expects from his early, once you get to maybe like, I forgot what point he says, maybe like A or B round, it can be quarterly, but anything before that, if you're not getting monthly updates from your founders, they literally have a spreadsheet that he tracks. I don't even know how much he cares about what's in the updates, but if he's not hearing from a founder on a monthly basis, like it could be a, like a BCC, like sending to all the found, uh, all the investors, it just means that they're, the lights are still on. Right. And he said the best indicator for him of when a company is going to like basically call him up and say, we're winding down is the amount of time that it's taken for him to hear from that founder unsolicited. So 
that's, I think, just an interesting tidbit. And I think it makes sense. I can definitely think of lots of um, exceptions to that rule, but but I think that's a good thing for founders to think about. So that's one. Um, two, so for me, the way I operate is I look at my portfolio with two buckets. One bucket is I'm a cash investor and I've invested in almost every company that I have an equity position in. There's like maybe one or two examples where I wasn't able to make an investment, but I joined as an advisor and I took advisor equity. But for the most part, I'm an investor in basically all the companies I have that are part of the portfolio. And all of those, whether I do, and my range is basically like 10,000 10, to 100,000. There, there are exceptions on the low and the high end of that, but few and far between. Hmm. So um, whether it's a $10,000 or $100,000 investment, they're all kind of the same to me, right? Like they're all sort of like, I, I try to give equal weight. If one of the companies needs more of my time because I have unique expertise or I have, uh, they're moving to Chicago and they need a lot more help integrating into the community. Right. I will take a board advisor seat, a board director, board observer, uh, in, in uh, T-Bot's case, actually refounder, which basically just means a new co-founder. And I earn additional equity on top of my investment my involvement with founders is like my pie chart of time is basically all founders, right? Like, you know, not including my wife and shout out to my wife. Um, uh, she's amazing. She puts up with a lot. Uh, she, I don't know if she'll hate this or not, but um, she, we just found out this week we're having a boy. So I got to uh, give her props uh, for putting up with all my stuff, but you might've just saw she left. Uh, anyway, um, and we're excited about that. It's our first, first baby. Um, That's another shout out. Yeah. So my, my pie chart of time, professional time is all founders. And then it's just a question of like, how much of that do I allocate to each one? And like refounders, like it's like half or more of my time. Right. So that's mm -hmm. a lot. And then the rest is sort of like the rest of the portfolio. And then some of those take pieces as well. Cause I'm, you know, I'll earn like a half a point or a point or, or more in some of those startups, depending on how early they are, how much time they need, et cetera. And I really don't try to make that like, I think there's there's a lot of uh, stigma around investors taking additional equity if they're an investor. And I actually push back on that 100%. And the reason is I'm not doing that because I'm like trying to improve the terms or something. I'm just saying I've got limited bandwidth and time. I'm trying to be fair to the portfolio founders. If they need more of the time that I than I have to give, I have to give an argument to the other founders. Why are you, it's like your kids. If you have like 10 kids, you can't put all of your time in one of, like one of the kids has to pay you more. <laughs> Right. <laughs> they want me to take them to more basketball games or whatever. <laughs> so, anyway, that's sort of a joke, but it, it's also kind of true. That makes sense. You talked about the on the advisory board, right? And yep. do you take advisory board without investing cash money? If so, um, like what kind of equity do you, do you take? Usually, how does that work? Because I we got a lot of questions of founder want to build advisory board, and yep. they might not looking for cash, but looking for advisors. Um, yeah, I never yeah, take cash. From the, the startups that I that I invest in, like the absolute last thing they need, I don't want them paying consultants or advisors or anybody, right? Like they they're, no. they're they're cash strapped, right? And I'm giving them. I mean, I'm not giving them enough money for them to to live off of. We need to bring in other investors, and if we have to bring in other investors, and I'm telling those investors, hey, by the way, which are in most cases my friends or at least people that I know well enough. To make introductions for oh by the way this company that you're putting in money is paying me fifty thousand dollars a year or something to be an advisor that's insane I, I would i would be angry about that but i will disclose and say i'm an advisor as well or i'm on you know like actually i'm on the board of uh directors as a an observer i'm a board observer of a company i've got a board meeting for tomorrow i started as an advisor and they asked me to join as an observer because they want me in those those conversations so um so uh, I would never, it would be a flag for me if I saw an advisor taking cash out of a startup, right? That's but the it's common for the advisor to take a small equity off the startup. Yes, and, right. and so, okay, so the second half of that question is every startup that I look at a deck on, right? It'll, they'll inevitably have like, here are our team and it's like them, a co-founder, like, you know, one or two technical people, here are our advisors. My first question is, are these advisors compensated? And if they go, yes, I go, great. I, I assume they're, you're giving them like half a point, point kind of thing. That's pretty standard for early stage, <laughs> Excuse me, d d depending on the 
the amount of time and energy, what their ask is, et cetera. Uh, and if they say no, then I said, well, why? Because you're asking them to give this time and energy one, but two, and more importantly, mm -hmm. they're going to lose interest, right? They're like, yeah. the reality of the situation is the best people that you want to have be your advisors are super, super busy and they have to prioritize their time. Just like I said, with my, my internal portfolio. So if you want me to be an advisor of your company, but you don't want to compensate me to do that, that's actually called a mentor. So I actually do have a, a verbal delineation between those. And I'm happy yeah. to mentor, yeah. but mentoring is much, you're not going to put me on your deck if I'm a mentor, right? And that means you've got limited access because I've got limited time. So if you really want to have the ability to sort of advertise, Chris is associating with this company, and I won't just be an ad advisor of anybody. I've got to really believe in that founder. And I, I have to think there's a real business there because putting my brand, my name associated with whatever that thing is, is a signal. And that's true of anybody. So um, that, that might've been more than you were asking for, but I think that's a really important question. And there is a lot of debate on this too. And, and there aren't really standards amongst uh, investors and ad advisors and all that. Like I, I'd like that to be a standardized nomenclature around advisor signifies you're getting compensation, hopefully non-cash compensation because then also everybody's incentives are aligned. I, it's a, it makes me want to make the company more successful because then we all get the payout at the end, right? Absolutely. Not during uh, the beginning, taking cash out, that's crazy, so. How do you evaluate um, such an early stage, right? So science, but it's an art, right? Evaluating a company, like how, how people check your writing. Is it, what? how much they're asking? Is it a market? Like, like what's it like so early stage too for you? Yeah, it's it's so much more art than science at this stage. It is like it, I I couldn't do this if I didn't have this super superpower. I I mean that, like you it it there's so much pattern recognition. It's like I'll give the example uh, with like a house. My wife and I six years ago were looking were looking for a house, and and thankfully we didn't love the first house that we saw. Actually, like a couple in, we ended up. I think we lost like four houses. We put like. I, I go on tangents all the time. There were like three or four that we were in love with and, and like got stolen from us. But the one that we ended up with that we really loved the most, we saw that after like 60 homes, right? And we really knew this checks every box we're looking for. So as an investor, if, if there are any like early stage investors or thinking about being an investor or just in a, in, uh, a founder trying to get in the minds of investors, it's really important for investors to see tons and tons and tons of opportunities before they start jumping in. And, and they can sort of like, it's almost like, like you can do, before you like invest in stocks, you can do these sort of like phantom stock markets where it's like, you know, play money, right? And, and you can test, do that for like a year or two and like see which ones you invested in, which ones you decided to pass on and go back and do a post-mortem, like which ones did well which ones didn't? I actually was just going through my folders the other day of potential investments. And I, I make a folder for potential investments. I put the old, uh, you know, whatever uh, documents I get, one pagers or, or decks or whatever. But I was going through and like sort of organizing stuff. And I said, wow, that one failed. 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 Damn it. I missed that one. Why did I miss that one? And I go back into like email and, and I figured I actually found one of them where I, I replied a month late and the, the round passed. No. I'm actually getting in that, that company right now. I won't say which one it is because they're raising around, but um, it's actually kind of a funny story. I would have gotten in a, a much lower uh, uh, valuation, um, but that's, that's a good, uh, a good lesson to learn. So I think the biggest thing is like pattern recognition, know what your strengths are, play to those, and on the, on the founder side, you don't want bad investors. Hmm. Let me explain what I mean by that. A bad investor is going to run you on wild goose chases. A bad investor is going to get pissed at you when you wind down the company. A bad investor is going to nag you for details and information that is absolutely immaterial to your success and my opportunity to make money off your success. So, it is really important that you get good vetting from the investors that you take money from. And that also includes like the friends and family stuff, right? You gotta be really clear okay, with the yeah. people. Yeah, cause you're taking people's money, right? It's not their fault 
you need to be the bigger, you need to be the adult in the room. I don't care if you're a 19 year old founder taking money from your, your uncle, you have to be the adult in the room, you know better. So make sure you are really qualifying those people that are giving you money and they're coming with good references. I always tell every founder and, and actually it's probably an exception now because I've been doing deals so fast recently that this may slip through the cracks. If it does, I apologize to any, any of my founders, but I will always give the option to my founders and really encourage them to talk to existing founders that I've invested in. Ask them, what are my strengths and weaknesses? How have I helped them? How have I not helped them? Where, where, like, where do they wish Chris could add value that I haven't? Just so you know, I want it to be mutually beneficial. If I can't add, so I tell all my founders, if, if I don't punch above my weight, meaning if the check that I give you is the most value that you get from me, then I have failed as an investor. That is my ethos. I live and die by that. If the most value that you got from me was that twenty thousand dollar or fifty or hundred thousand dollar right. check, then like you can get that from anybody. Well, it's money's kind of commoditized. Money. Yeah. Um, from the founder side, I think the question that we got asked a lot is, you know, we just started this company. You have a prototype. Like, how do I? If that, how do I know how much I ask, right, for the angel investors? Um, like, have you seen different models when they evaluate from the founder side? Um, you know, something ridiculous evaluation, perhaps, or somebody like under asking. Uh, what do you What do you see more early stage Chicago? At least fifty percent of the time, that's a conversation that I have with them, right? Mm -hmm. Like, if they're looking for their first check, especially if they're a first time founder, they don't know this stuff. And so I put my mentor hat on more than my investor hat in a lot of cases. There are situations where I'll say, "Look, I'm not an investor because you're not from Chicago." which I try to filter those out so we're not wasting each other's time or, you know, uh, what, for whatever reason, uh, I would say biotech or like med tech, but I'm actually, I just closed on an investment. Another shout out to a portfolio company, Dimension Inks. Amazing. Uh, they're printing bone. It's like, it'll blow you. The, the founder or the, the CEO of it uh, is the, the woman who ran uh, and started UI Labs. She's an absolute rock star. I'm investing in her. I think that the IP in the company is great, but I'm investing in her. Uh, oh, right. So I was going to say, like, sometimes there are carve outs, like I won't invest in med tech. There is an exception to that now. Um, but if I say, you know, there's an exception, but but I want to help you, right? Like, here's some mentoring. I think your round size is too small. I think you need to ask more. I think you should, instead of asking for a million dollars, I think you need to go for like a quick 250 round that you know you could close sooner, raise that at a cheaper valuation. That'll get people interested like me that want to jump in and understand the risk of a one or two cap uh, uh, note or safe versus investing at a five cap and you got no product or anything now, like you're getting too far ahead of yourself. You're going to get over your skis. You're not going to raise your round and then everybody's in trouble. So, um, so yeah, I tr it's, it's really like, and a lot of that conversation is important in my evaluation. Everything is the conversation. I'm evaluating everything. How do they think? How coachable are they? Do they just listen to what I say and fall over dead? That's not good either. Like watch Shark Tank. If you, if you see the founders that walk in the room and say, we want an investment because we want you to tell us what to do. They'll say <laughs> bye next because they don't have time to tell you what to do. They want your founders to be autonomous, but you need to be coachable. So I don't. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. So so it does sound like it's a conversation, and I think founders sometimes going in thinking like I have to know the answers to all the questions, have to know the answer to like finance. It's not the case, right? It's a conversation. And you talk to different people, you have different answers, really. You gotta really make up your own mind at the end of the day and, and decide which whose money to take and whatnot. So th I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and you you brought a really important point. I just want to like uh, emphasize that advisors, investors, board directors, well, a little bit different with board directors, but uh, we are there to give advice. We are there to give perspective. We do not control your business. I'm refounder of Tbot with with Raymond, and he's the CEO of the company. I'm a new co-founder. Sometimes I go on these rants and these like tirades and then I go, Whoop. <laughs> sorry, Raymond, you're the CEO. This is ultimately your baby. It's your decision. This is just what I think. And you have to always remember that as the investor, but also the founder. Don't just take what this person is telling me, even if they've been around the block for 30 years, you know best, you have more information than they do. Just take all of those 
perspectives and synthesize them and try to make the right, right decision. Absolutely. I think at the end of the day, it's your company. You started it. The founder started it, right? And yeah. if it failed, you know, you're the one running it. Um, so what, what are some common mistakes that you see when people like early stage founder talking to you? Um, is it because like market fit or is it just not the right team? Like, what do you see in your experience here in Chicago? It's never one thing. Um, I mean, really, hopefully, if I've done a good job, it's not the founder. Right. Because my biggest filter is picking the best people and the best people that are most capable, that have the most grit that. Um, and so there are so many variables that, that the founder can't control. And I wouldn't say that there's any that I see typically like markets change. Investment dries up. They never really got product market fit. And, and that is usually something that other investors can't argue because they don't invest until they get product market fit in Chicago, typically. I love that, right? Like I'm in, you know, I, okay. I just invested in a one cap uh, uh, safe, right? That's like, you you know the risk that you're taking to get that kind of uh, a, re a potential return. There's a risk reward. So I wanna be the person that's gonna help guide them instead of them fumbling around for a really long time and not getting the product market fit figured out right why not if the best place I can be to help them is in the early days when they're trying to figure out all those, those things. I want to be involved then and I want to get part of the upside for that, right? I can invest after product market fit and then it's probably worth, you know, six to eight cap, you know, depending, right? Maybe even like, you know, four to, four to eight cap, depending. Um, and so the fun part for me is, is sort of getting in the trenches and get your hands dirty and really trying to work with the founder to solve those problems, but you've got to have your big boy pants on as an investor and mm -hmm. the founders, I tell them, cause I just had a founder that came to me and, um, uh, in, you know, things didn't work out. This was a little while ago, about a year ago. And I said, like, if you hear from any of your founders that give you a hard time, I want to know who they are because I want to know that I can't invest with them. I don't want to, I don't want to be a co-investor with somebody who gives you a hard time for doing everything that you can to make, us money, right? It's not your fault as long as you did everything you could, which I, I know I know when they do and they, when they don't usually. Uh, it is, it's not their fault, right? There's a lot of outside variables that they can't control. And it is our job as investors to be thoughtful and human and have empathy and try to help those founders through that transition and get them to the next place in their life. And, and hopefully, you know, we'll all win. I think I, you have to have the really like long view with this when you're a founder or an investor. And I have a multi-decade view and I'm gonna give a shout out. I'm sure they're not watching, but Troy Hennikoff and Mark Ackler from Math Ventures, I'm in their camp of, I'm not in it for this investment or the next one or the one. I'm in it for the long term. I, I wanna do this forever. I, I love I love the founders I work with. Yeah, that's great. Um, I wanna get some really tactical questions before we go. So sure. for, for founder, wanna reach an angel investor like yourself, right? So we talk about Ian with Twitter, that's fantastic. but. Good question. Do you get a lot of cold emails from yeah. just all kinds of people? Like, what what's like a good cold email? Like, you don't want to get ten paragraphs, of course. You don't want to yeah. get one line investing my million dollar idea. Like, yeah. what's a good good email that the founder would, you would appreciate getting? So, this is a hard one, but <laughs> I really prefer not to get cold emails. I prefer not to get a cold. LinkedIn request, especially a LinkedIn request that just says, I, I want to join your network. Like that doesn't help me in any way. If I've never met you, I'm not going to accept that. Um, do your homework, right? And I don't mean just with me. I mean with investors. This is this is a founder now talking, not not an investor. And I've, I've found a lot of it. I'm founder, co-founder, or founding team of like a ton of stuff. So as a founder, be thoughtful, right? Like how would you want somebody to reach out to you? Would you would you want to be part of a BCC email that says like, hey, investor, check out my startup. It's really cool. I'm sure you want to invest right back if you want to hear more. Like why? No, there I don't. Answer? Yeah, like I have no time and I actually don't, I could never make another investment and still be busy for the rest of my life just working with the founders that I'm working with now. So if you want to get my attention or really any other investor's attention, be really, really, you can't be thoughtful enough, right? Like I've never seen like, you've been too thoughtful. 
I've never, that's something I'll never say, right? Like you've, oh my God, look at how much research you've done. How, like, you know, how'd you know that I liked spaghetti when I was 15 years old? You know, like, it, like really understand the person that you're, you're trying to build a relationship with. Make that first impression. This is what I do. I call this hacking serendipity. Figure mm -hmm. out how to hack serendipity with your investors. Figure out who, if this isn't hard today. This was really hard 20 years ago. We have LinkedIn, right? I was in the eight, first 8,000 people on LinkedIn. I've used it a lot over the past 10 to 15 years of my life. Go on LinkedIn, find out who all our mutual connections are. If we don't have any, then why, right? Like get to know more people in Chicago. It, that's really important. Right. If you're myopically focused on building your business, you're not going to be able to be successful. Business is about relationships and community, period. End of story. Whether you're creating them over Zoom, you're creating them in person at a T-Bot, plug to T-Bot at, at 1871, another plug. Um, or however you're building, can be building a relationship over email. Be thoughtful, right? Like reach out with purpose. And the best way to reach out is to get an introduction from somebody else that is a strong mutual connection. So in the case of, let's say Anson, you, you and I don't know each other, but you go, wow, I, Chris sounds really interesting. He said something that really resonated with me. I'd love to meet him. Go on LinkedIn, type in my name, who are our mutual connections? Let's say you've got 20 mutual connections. Oh boy, well, who, who do I ask? Go through those 20 connections and say, who are the ones that I'm really close with? Because some of those are just, like I met once, right? Well, that's the person who's like looking for the intro. So maybe of the 20, there are five that I know well. Go and ask each one of them, how well do you know Chris? And maybe four of them say, I met him in passing. But one of them says, we go on trips together. That's the person that you ask for an intro, right? Because they, they know both parties really well. I'm going to take an intro from any of my friends that I go on trips with. Right. So be thoughtful. I, this is a long answer and I don't mean to we're over time, but it is probably the most important question that you've asked today because founders aren't going to succeed unless they figure out how to build strong relationships, especially with investors. And, and this isn't something that just is like, this is what you should do with investors. It's with anybody. This is like a life lesson. How do you reach out to somebody that you want to get to know? And this is, this is my suggestion. Do it through a trusted relationship if you can. And if you can't, do whatever you can to try to build to your, your community and your, I hate the term network because it's so transactional, but really try to build strong relationships. And the more relationships you have and the more diverse they have, that's how many people you have on LinkedIn. And that's going to increase the number of second degree connections you have, right? So there's a little yeah. bit of the method, method to the madness. Even if you don't think that there's an interest in taking this uh, this introduction, always accept it because if it, it it could end up being somebody you're really close friends with, but you never do a deal with, Absolutely. and that leads to other stuff. So it does sound like the best way to send a code email is not to send a code email. You know, it's, and if it's you're really going to be extremely thoughtful, like do so much research. This is why I'm reaching out to you. Like, don't email Mark Cuban and say I saw you on Shark Tank. So did like. 30 other million people in the US, right? 30 million other people in the US. So reach out to Mark Cuban. He is actually very approachable, surprisingly. If you reach out to Mark Cuban, tell him why, uniquely why. If you reach out to me or, or Anson, tell us why. And hopefully we're, we're able to, to take that and, and do something with it. Absolutely. And on the other side is don't be afraid to reach out. I think a lot of founders yeah. are really nervous, be like, hey, is it ready? Should I wait another month? And I think that sort of hesitation is also bad too, right? Not a, a blind code email, you know, but definitely like what Chris was saying through your network, but but start building that network immediately because you don't know when's gonna, you know, when's gonna benefit you, right? Build build the community. Let's build let's, a community. Let's start build, build a community. Word. That's right, that's right. Connections network. Just give me. I, by the way, anybody on here that knows me would know. Any event that says networking, I avoid like the plague, because they attract the vendors that carpet bomb business cards. They, they their whole goal is how many business cards can I unload in half an hour? That's like if you're going to an event and you happen to be in an event where it's like a networking thing. Make a relationship with somebody for a 15 minute conversation. You, you got to be careful. You don't, you don't talk their ear off, but 
but don't see how many people can I talk to at this event. Look at each one of those events as a unique opportunity to really build a relationship with somebody. Quality, really, really yeah. like deep. Don't go wide, go deep. I totally agree. Yeah. I think this is a great time, great topic to close out our interview. Um, yeah. Chris, thanks so much for hopping on the uh, Hustle Talk. Um, I'm sure myself included, our audience learned a lot from you too. Uh, this has been awesome, man. And anytime, I, I love what you guys are doing at Gray. This is fantastic. Thanks for including me. Entrepreneurship. Somehow, we've come to believe it is reserved for a chosen few, for the well-educated, for the prodigies, and the rest of us can only stand by in admiration. We forget that it is not something anyone is born with. It is not more unique to us than a beating heart. We all have it in us, every one of us. Sometimes it's something you plan, but oftentimes it's just something you refuse to give up. It feeds your passion and actions. It silently weeds out the unmotivated from the ambitious. Sometimes it's about changing the world, and other times it's about changing your own world. It's never about seeking comfort. It's always about innovations and discoveries through the grind and the undying desire to win. So, discover what you're made of. Discover Gray.
What is up, gang? Welcome to another episode of Hustle Talk. Today it's a very special episode. I sat down with active angel investor Christopher Deutsch. We talked about what makes a founder great, what makes a startup successful and get funded. And we together discussed how angel investors evaluate startups' ideas and entrepreneurs. Chris has over 20 years experience starting up, investing in, and advising early stage venture backed startups. His investment ranges from five to six figures, usually in pre seed or C stage startups. He is also the founder and managing director of Lofty Ventures. With this kick ass bio, the first question, of course, I will ask is Hey, Chris, what else did we miss about your bio? Here's what he said. Let's take a look. <laughs> 